Welcome to Living Well with MS. This podcast comes to you from Overcoming MS, the world's leading multiple sclerosis healthy lifestyle charity, which helps people live a full and healthy life through the Overcoming MS program. We interview a range of experts and people with multiple sclerosis. Please remember, all opinions expressed are their own. Don't forget to subscribe to Living Well with MS on your favorite podcast platform so you never miss an episode. And now, let's meet our guest. And joining me on this edition is Mike Kennedy. And Mike has been following OMS for quite a number of years, six years out of, um, I think, diagnosed 10 years ago. So he's got a lot of experience with following Overcoming MS. And it would be very interesting. I think he's got a very good story to tell. So welcome to the show. And Mike, to start off with, could you introduce yourself and tell us a bit about your day to day? Hi, Jeff. Um, thank you for, you already said my name, but my name is indeed Michael Kennedy. Um, my day to day life, well, I'm a director of a custom installation company in the smart technology world. So we do bars, restaurants, and eateries to private residential properties, whether it be um, renovations or new builds and all the technology they would want within it. Um, in my other parts of my day-to-day life, which are the most important ones, I am um, my wife, Alicia, is um, an incredible mother now to our little baby girl, Sky. She's just turned six months old, and I can tell you that's why we've had to wait for this podcast, because <laughs> I'm still pretty sleep-deprived, but it's just got a little bit better. So, uh, yeah, I'm pretty busy as a, a father, uh, a business owner, and a no messer. So, yeah, there's lots of stuff going on. That's my experience of, of, of having children was we got to the point where you think I can't take this anymore with the sleep and then they said sleep a little bit long there was sense that you are to the limit and they go oh, I'll sleep a bit more then and then each time it was like okay we'll just yeah, give you like a they, bit more they know they're taking the mickey a little bit too much and they give you a little bit more respite so you yeah. can cope I'm at the other end now so I've got teenagers who Right. Just, problems. just lie to me, Jeff, and tell me it gets better. <laughs> oh, it's easy. Yeah, they basically, yeah, they both look after <laughs> us now. I really appreciate that. Thank you. <laughs> um, so you you were diagnosed with MS ten years ago, and how was that process? How was the diagnosis yeah, I mean, process? I, for it you? was. Um, I'm I'm very fortunate in that my mother runs a very large independent charity called Ladies Fighting Breast Cancer which is a voluntary charity that's raised a lot of money for breast cancer care in the Midlands because she had a couple of friends that unfortunately um, were diagnosed with the disease and had a terrible time with it. So she wanted to uh, fight back against that and because they were doing like, you know, what usual people do when you, you might find out your friend has a problem like that. They were doing like local coffee mornings and fundraisers, raising some money and sending it off and it was going to London. And not coming back to the Midlands. My mother's a Manchester woman and she said, ah, I'm not having that. <laughs> so she started her own charity and made sure that every penny raised stayed in the Midlands to help people around her local area. Um, due to this, she obviously had great contacts in the medical field. And when I, my original symptom was uh, optic neuritis, I suddenly woke up one morning. I was between things at the time, just come back from Manchester, moving into a house in the Midlands, and I was living with my mother. I came downstairs for breakfast in the morning. I said, Mum, I've got blurred vision. She said, oh, I'll get to the optician. I was, so I went to the optician. And she said, and they said, look this way, look that way. And it was really painful. I said, oh, that doesn't look good. So they sent me down to A&E for a scan. Um, anyway, I didn't get a scan. They just pulled my arms, pushed my arms, checked if I'd got lost my strength or weakness. They probably thought I had a stroke. But because I was fully str- strong and nothing else wrong with me, they just sent me home. Very luckily, I was at one of my mother's fundraising events, and this was only a couple of weeks later. And her fr- her friend, who is an anaesthetist, looked at me and said, "I think Mike's got a bigger problem than we realised." And he sent me for a private scan. This scan then picked up the lesions in my brain. He then kept this a secret from me because I didn't know what that would mean. But he said, "I want to get another scan with the contrast dye to get more of an idea of what's going on." I then had the injection in my arm, had another scan, and within a couple of months was sent to a neurologist and he said, um, I can confirm you have a, this is multiple sclerosis. And I can be totally honest with you, I had not, not the scooby, the funniest idea what he was on about. I'd never heard of it before, never come across it before. 
And I was like, well, what does this mean? Because I, I, I got on the floor and I did 20 press-ups. I was like, what, 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 I, I feel grand, what's going on? And he said, oh, no, no. And he did this chart on the wall. He said, you know, most, a lot of people, they have this kind of time with it. Uh, unfortunately, some people have a very bad time with it and they end up like this. Other people have, you know, about 20% of people, they end up not being very bothered by it at all and they get along just fine. So I was like, right, grand. Um, went home, mum, still. Not not a notion that this was a massive thing in my life where it impacted me so badly. And then I did what I'm sure a lot of my our friends in, our, in this world have done, the worst thing I've ever done. Get on YouTube, get on Google. And I, all I see is just, you know, the worst tales. Um, this was up to 11, 10 years ago, so, uh, you know, Richard Pryor, you see so many different people who've had just terrible times. I just see a, a, a cacophony of like, endless wheelchairs. And I just dive into this depths of despair because that's once I've seen that and once I've heard that this can happen, your mind will always go to the worst possible place. It's a terrible thing, isn't it? But that's just how, if you think if it's possible, that's going to be me. It's a very natural thing to do, I guess. It's catastrophized. So in the first few months, almost to a year, I... I was just looking around for, I wanted anything but this to be true. So I was thinking, how can I get the, out of this situation? So any cure, any anything I could find to try and make the situation disappear, I, I tried. And very quickly, unbeknown to me, I'd never been depressed before, but well, I was quite clearly got into a very big uh, depression. And I actually, weirdly enough, in the very in about six months, I found the work because I was just so desperate. I found the work of Roy Swank. And I heard all the anecdotes and, and what he'd been doing. And I thought, right, well, this seems pretty convincing to me. Look at all these stories of people that have stayed, remained well for so long uh, by following his, his, his protocol, his diet. And so I literally started dieting like he had suggested. And I was juicing raw fruits. I bought a juicer. I must have lost, not the big fellow, not horrendously, but I must have lost about two or three stone because I was petrified to eat anything that would be against what he had recommended. Um, yeah, and then I was at a friend's birthday, right? I don't know going, but I was at a friend's birthday, and it, I, I looked pretty gone. They said, oh, I might just try some ice cream. I must have had a couple of drinks, so I was oh, yeah, it's the first time in a while. I said, okay, I'll try some ice cream. And I know it sounds strange, but when I'm 24, I don't really understand quite how the metrics of all these things work. So, you know, I have a bit of ice cream, and, I, and nothing happened to me. I thought it was going to be instantaneous. You know, if I'd had dairy or had ice cream or saturated fat, it would impact me. Because not knowing, obviously, how, how, how it all works and how it all comes together. So when I, fe when I felt grand, and when the next day nothing happened to me, I was like, oh, well. I thought, I've just had some ice cream. I just had a brownie, and I feel fine. So this is, I don't need to do this. <laughs> and then put a, few, put a bit of weight back on. I started feeling well. Because quite clearly what had happened is I had, in that first sort of year and a half, I had optic neuritis, had numb feet, and I had an MS hug. And um, within, you know, three to six months, it all resolved almost back to normal. The only thing that lingered was a bit of a, a burning, fuzzy sensation in my feet. Best way I can describe it is when you are, when you've been on a long walk in the, in the wet, in the snow, and you've got socks on and they're wet and your feet sort of crinkle. It's like, feels like that, but the, all the time. Um, mm -hmm. And that was the only thing that remained. But other than that, I was grand. Nothing wrong with me at all. Uh, and I thought, right, well, that is that it. Because <laughs> I'm clearly I'm going to get on fine. Um, so I, I was kind of half aware that this might just be, you know, I can't continue just li like my old life. But I thought I could regain all of it rather than a bit of it. So I, I started eating, you know, pizzas and just junk food and just going, oh, I feel great, and just doing some of the old things I used to do. And it was only when um, I had uh, another relapse, probably, what was it four or five years ago, maybe even longer, I thought, all oh, right, I'm not quite away from this. And then you get look into it again, you actually understand, it. that's when I found OMS because I started to look into it again. And then I saw the work of George Janonek, I was familiar with him. 
I saw that he wrote a book. I saw that um, he had uh, looked into Royce Frank's work, but had taken it on yet, and yet again. And more, imp more, more importantly, he was also in the medical field, and he'd used it himself to great, to great effect. So that, that made me even more determined. I was like, well, this is not just one, uh, one medical person, neurologist, who's, who's, who's championing this. It's actually someone who is an MS patient who is in the medical field who is not only championing this, who's living this. So that just convinced me. Uh, I listened to all of his, um, he done little videos on YouTube, he'd done all sorts. I'm, I don't know what I'm telling you because you obviously know all about it more than me. Um, and I've been right, this, I'm, I'm convinced now. Um, this is, I'm not for turning because, um, you know. The, and have you stuck with it after that? Yeah, after because that I was like, right, well, I, I've gone back eating Greg's <laughs> and uh, all these kind of things from now and again. And it's like I'm, I'm Mars bars and, and uh, Greg's is a notorious fast food place in oh. the UK for those who yeah, yeah apology. It's just yeah, you can just go in there and you can get all world of saturated and greasy things. It's like a lunchtime staple or an after night out staple. <laughs> uh, yeah, I wouldn't recommend it to any of us ever again. <laughs> No, even yeah. though they do vegan, they do a famous vegan sausage roll. Yeah, yeah, I, I had one of those, and then I was like, right, I'll have one of these, and that's it. A one-time thing, because, yeah, it's, it's certainly not healthy. Um, yeah, and that, so, AMS, I was more determined than ever. That I, well, actually, the thing is, that I was more convinced that if I had stuck with the work of Roy Swank, plus the additions of Genelec and AMS, I'm absolutely convinced I wouldn't have run into this, this symptom, this trouble. Because I was doing so well, I was very stable. And the only thing that I can think had knocked me back on this course because I'd sorted out my vitamin D level. I was starting taking you know, 10,000 international units a day. Um, I was in the sun as much as I could be when, when the weather allowed. Uh, I was exercising um, for the, all the other pillars apart from meditation, which I still really have to work on because that's a great pillar that I um, am not very good at. But yeah, all those things I was kind of doing. But the, the diet is obviously one of the main, if not the main thing to address. And because I would got lax with that, I wanted to just tell anybody that was thinking, because obviously what happened to me is I, I'd, I'd have a few symptoms. They then uh, resolved. I'd gone into like a mini remission. Um, or a period of where I wasn't getting attacked. And if I would have then been very strict, I'm sure I wouldn't have come in. I'm more than certain if I did come into any issues again, they would have been a lot less severe than the ones that I did come into. And it is one of the pillars, isn't it? To, that exactly. It's for life. Change your life for life. It's not, you, you can't stop. You're, mm. you're doing it forever. And, and, and I think it's, it's not just MS as well. I mean, the, increasingly I speak to people, there's a guy I interviewed the other day. I think it may well come out after this episode, but but um, we're talking about um, autoimmunity. He's an autoimmune specialist, and it's not just uh, MS. It's you know, and it's so similar actually. If you speak to people who are following diets and lifestyles for cancer, for diabetes, for heart disease, the similarities are extraordinary. You think, hang on, it's pretty much the same. They're sort of saying, oh yeah, like dairy is almost always. Don't have dairy, low saturated fat, exercise, mindfulness. You think that sounds pretty familiar? And it's just there's there's tweaks, but very similar. And vitamin D is another one. This guy, you know, he's an autoimmune specialist, and he's not not an MS specialist. Auto, he's all autoimmune conditions. And he was like, "Yep, you need to have vitamin D. You need to have good gut health. You know, you know all these things." And you just think, "Wow, it's, it's so similar." And so even if I mean, I think if they cured MS, which is not impossible, there are talk. There's talk of various things that might be able to. There's the Epstein Barr virus things and stuff. But I think even then, I I just feel so much healthier, and I don't. I certainly, um, I don't think I'd go back to eating the way I did before, or you know, and just think, yeah, diet, exercise, mindfulness, um, and vitamin D really is is things. And they're saying you know, vitamin D may not have an effect on people with MS, but it certainly has an effect on whether you get MS. And, and this guy was saying, well, he thinks it has an effect on other things. And it certainly has an effect on taking up calcium and there's all sorts of things. So I just, I don't think I'd change at all. 
And you get used oh, to the diet, don't you? I, I can safely say, Jeff, I uh, okay, what you're saying there. If, if I was told right now, Mike, you no longer have MS and you will not contract it again, I would not go back to eating cheese. I would not go back to eating dairy. I would not go back to eating big fat burgers. I, honestly, I, I think I've heard uh, Jeff say this and say, it's all habitual because these are my habits that I built up over my life. And when I mm. adjusted it to go without it, I honestly, I, I can't. It's kind of strange. I cannot, I, d I really detest the smell of burning sausages and meat and, and, and milk, milk, uh, milk tastes vile to me now. And cheese, I don't want cheese on pizzas. I now have, I now have cheese with pizzas, even, no. even the vegan cheese. It's not that healthy. Yeah, no, that's a funny one. You try to convince me. They go, oh, we've got vegan cheese. Go, no, I just don't want cheese. Which they have in Italy, bizarrely. You go to Italy, they're quite, I mean, they do, and, it, and really good pizza restaurants quite often will do some pizzas without cheese. And it's, a, it's a normal thing in Italy, but in America, it's totally, it's not, so. I like it. It's great. Yeah. I have a cheese. Yeah. That's yeah. no, really good. P pizza without cheese. Yeah, really I nice can care. But yeah, I have to say, I mean, it's really tough because obviously we have major motivators to want to change. Uh, people who, don't have, and I hope they don't, I hope nobody gets a uh, reason like this to have that level of uh, need or desire to change. It's very hard to turn them against you know, a cheese board <laughs> or a pizza or a, or a cheeseburger or, a, or ice cream, a dairy ice cream, because they just can't, they just, it, it's a habit and they, they sort of, they've had it all their lives and they think it's never yeah. doing them any harm, but it's only when you they'll reach latter life perhaps and that hopefully they're uh, their dietary habits don't creep up and catch them out because all the studies you know, around the world say that eating in this way is a big reason why a lot of us are unwell these days. Yeah, I mean, and we're both in the UK and there's a big um, BBC thing at the moment about ultra-processed foods and the problem that that's causing. So there's, yeah, certainly, I mean, and, and you can be an unhealthy vegan, that's oh. the other thing to remember. Ultra-processed food is ultra-processed food if it's just because it doesn't have meat in it doesn't mean it's good for you necessarily so i think you need to be a bit cautious of these um fake meat substitute things that have 35 i've got to say you know um, when i was first diagnosed it was a lot tougher of a world to be this way in the last 10 years everything's gone fully blown the other way i mean like you know i'm seeing things available I don't have them, but like even um, I used to love drinking a Mars refuel. <laughs> but now there's vegan, there's like non dairy Mars refuels. Thinking, yeah, but that drink is still not healthy. <laughs> it hasn't got dairy in it, but all the stuff that is in it yeah. is just not good. But the, I think that everyone's jumping on this bandwagon now of, of health foods and alternative foods, and like you know, you, you get oats. In, my, in my, I get, I've got a bag of oats downstairs that I put in my shape, um, in my shake that I make every morning, and it says gluten free. We get oats are gluten free by definition. They, yeah. they say gluten free for the sake of it. It's like a marketing ploy now. Well, yeah, no, yeah, no, yeah. Like gluten free rice. Yeah, that's like, you know, I didn't expect there to be gluten in my rice. Yeah, <laughs> but they, yeah. they just put it on there now just because they think it's going to gather them more favour with the with the dry, buying public. Yeah. yeah. Well, it probably does. It probably does sell more. Um, yeah, but anyway, um, just uh, so you have, uh, I hear you've uh, had multiple neurologists now, so um, and and you've got a much better neurologist. So how well? How was your original? Yeah, neurologist great question. Yeah, from? thankfully I've forgotten all about him until you <laughs> until you mentioned. No, no, uh, yeah, it was uh, the Queen Elizabeth Hospital in Birmingham. Uh, Doctor Nazi Brada. I'll never forget his name. He had a very bad poor uh, bedside manner, um, and. <laughs> Yeah, he, he just looked at I came in for a meeting with him and he looked at my scan on his computer, looked back at me and goes, oh, I'm sorry, this is uh, this is very bad, very bad. It's very aggressive, very aggressive. You need to start this drug immediately, otherwise it can go very worse. And I can't remember exactly, I think he was Romanian or Russian. And I was just like, what? Okay. Um, and he just basically gave me the the the, the, the or information about Capaxone or a another, and I went home and I got into the car uh, with my mother and I said, oh, I, I'm not convinced by this. I ain't going to take this injection. There's another way. I'm sure of it. Uh, and yeah, it's like it really, really. I didn't like. So thankfully, it was also a, a slice of luck because I wasn't quite in the right postcode to have him as my neurologist. So when this was realised, I got sent to another one. And then when I met my new neurologist, 
his name was uh, Professor Michael Douglas. <laughs> and I was like, wow, I've only heard that name once before. But yes, I get that all the time. <laughs> uh, but yeah, his, his, he was just a completely different kettle of fish altogether, a really positive gent. And he said, yeah, I've, I've seen, I've, I've checked you over, I can see your scans, but you know, you've been pretty stable. And I think we should just have a check and just see how things go. You know, um, I think it's completely reasonable not to be on any any disease modifying drugs at this stage. And we'll keep I'll keep an eye on you every every year and see what happens. And he goes, "Can I please take your bloods?" I said, Absolutely, yeah. He goes, well, you know, I'm doing a, I'm doing a, a study because I believe Epstein Barr is a big thing. I believe it's a massive massive thing in MS, and I'm doing a study to, to all. He goes, "All of my patients, not one, hasn't had Epstein Barr." I said, "You know what?" Literally before four months before I got diagnosed, I had the worst glandular fever I can imagine. I, the first time I'd had it, it was awful. I even joked with my mother. I came down the steps one day. I said, "Mum, I'm going to send. I'm starting a charity called Men Fighting Tonsillitis because it was that bad." Her, her charity, Lady Fighting Breast Cancer. So that's the kind of joke I have with her. I'm like, "And how, how, how is that?" So I had the worst tonsillitis I've ever had it before. Only four or five months before I got diagnosed. So that. That lends me into the Epstein Barr theory even more. And when was this? This is quite a number of years yeah, ago. Yeah, I'm telling you. So he, he was on this 11 years ago. Right. Taking pe- taking right, his taking his um, his yeah. patient's blood, his MS patient's blood, for, to check for you know um, Epstein Barr or antibodies. Um, so incredible. I was, I've got to follow yeah. up with him on that because um, I'd be interested to see how far he's taken it. Yeah, no, that's amazing. Um, and another thing you've, that I've, I've read that you've um, explored is complementary therapies. There's a number of different ones. So, um, I mean, if we're sort of starting out with um, more widely used for MS, maybe would be cold therapy is one of them. So like cold showers, a lot of people have come across Wim Hof um, and uh, ice baths, cold showers, cryotherapy. So firstly what's it like how do you cope with it and secondly what are the benefits yeah thanks Um, i've tried a good few things let's leave no stone unturned as they say um and in recent times i I first tried um hyperbaric oxygen therapy at a clinic in coventry Mm -hmm. uh, because i'd heard again uh, in fact yeah it was like one of those old works tales my mother says oh my friend says they go to this hyper- she has ms and she goes to hyperbaric oxygen and she's been every week for the last 20 years and she go- and she won't miss it and she's absolutely fine so, right so she won't she won't not miss it now she won't she go every week without you know she religiously she will not miss a hyperbaric session like, that's interesting um at the time when i first went i can only say that i think my symptoms were so mild that any benefit i would have felt would be so so minor it's not anything um, so drastic that i've noticed this huge difference at the 10 year mark where my symptoms uh, at, the, at that time were a little more pronounced when i tried uh, hyperbaric oxygen for an hour and then cryotherapy i can only say it was the most incredible relief and feeling i've, I've experienced uh, i got out of the cryotherapy tank and i felt like i could run a marathon I never have run a marathon, but that's how I felt. Um, yeah, it's like all the inflammation in your legs, they feel heavy and that, you know, normally it's just that. Uh, it's like fresh blood came into my legs and it just like felt like it was the most incredible feeling. Like, I don't, uh, I can't, it's really hard to describe, but it's, I, I recommend anyone uh, with, with problems with inflammation or MS to try cryotherapy or so are you are you talking about where because I know that there's some centers where they put you in incredibly cold yeah. temperatures for a brief period for a quite a short period of time um and that that's much colder than and then you get an ice bath which is like zero and then you've got just a cold shower so are you talking about the like crazy cold temperatures for in a in an actual yeah, special so center I could ask my friend, a cold bath uh, is also very good that will numb your legs and that will make you feel great it's very hard to uh, to sit in there. You've got to wait for a couple of minutes until you you numb off. It's a very difficult thing to do for the squeamish or for the ones who who, are not, who don't like the cold so much. I've been I've been toughened up because I, I played rugby most of my life, and my teammates you know, they they'll just bully you if you if you're a bit if you're not strong enough. So all those kind of things were like I was toughened up to. But yeah, you know, getting in, a, in an ice bath uh, or a cold shower 
it's tough at first, but the benefits really do last and you feel great. Yeah, this is a cryotherapy, so it is much, much colder. It is, uh, it's just, it's, it's really cold. And it's supposed to only do it for three minutes. But I'm just like in there and saying, no, put me on another spin. It's like, we can't do this. It's like, no, another spin. Yeah. <laughs> they, they have to give me six minutes because I can just, I, I love it. And it just works so well. Um, I can't recommend it high enough, high enough if you can find somewhere that does it. Yeah, no, I've looked at because I've the, one of these things where you're saying mm. a, a friend of a friend had said, "Oh, you must try this." And the, but there's a centre in Pool in Dorset. It's it's uh, it's this a long, you know, these things that are a long, long way from where I live. So I was I was just thinking, well, if I do it and it's amazing, then I know I won't be able to do it regularly. And even actually hyperbaric oxygen, where in the UK the a lot of MS centres. So the MS Society, a lot of their centres have hyperbaric oxygen. They do actually in my county, but I live in a big county and this is right at the other end. So there's a number of people in my circle who do go to hyperbaric oxygen. They do think it's really beneficial. Um, but again, it's, it's, so, it's like an hour and a half drive for me to get to. So it's sort of, you're starting to think, well, if I do it for an hour, and it's an hour and a half there and an hour and a half back. Because I'm suddenly looking for sort of four hours every week to try and do that. And then, it's not yeah, the most convenient, difficult. but I can, I believe Michael Jackson had one in his house <laughs> and I can see why. <laughs> Good. <laughs> well, I mean, I, I mean, I don't, this may be coincidence, but, um, I, I did a lot of scuba diving. Um, and I've never, I, I've always, when I've been scuba diving, I've always felt really good since i've had ms this is so it always felt really good for my symptoms now i've put that down partly to there's no yeah, gravity but... so there's no balance issues and i'm kind of being supported so i don't have to do and you're actually deliberately not doing anything to um like it's not, you don't want to get out of breath because yeah. you're going to burn more oxygen burn more air so you're, you're deliberately trying to be quite calm and there's sort of a mindfulness to it it's cooling, naturally cooling you down. So you're cooler, you're, you're under pressure because you're probably like 30 to 40 meters under water. So you're under quite a lot of pressure. Um, and so you're kind of, you're sort of cold therapy. You're, you're kind of under pressure. So maybe it's doing those sort of things because I, I have found it. Yeah, but I, I, I sort of put it down to, oh, it's just really mindful and really calming and I really like scuba diving. But maybe there is an element of the pressure as well. And, and the cold. So. No, I'm sure there is because obviously the, the those tanks were obviously a lot of them were designed for getting the bends out of the divers. Yeah, yeah no, exactly. That is, yeah, I think, yeah, they were yeah. original purpose. Yeah, so I don't know who found yeah. the the new purpose of finding out it would be good in our situation or situation similar to ours. Because I saw, you know, cancer patients use it. You know, lots of different uh, people with ailments using them. Because um, I guess it just gets the oxygen deeper into your tissues than it can do normally. Because the pressure, so it'll push the oxygen deeper into your tissues that enables to help with repair. So I can just say from a personal experience that this is certainly something that happens. It doesn't necessarily mean it has to be drastic, but even a slight, a slight. The one I, the one I can give you is, for nine years, I had this feeling in my soles of my feet. It was never abating, but you know, you, it's like your mind learns to live with it. It's just part of. It just becomes your new normal. Mm -hmm. And I've got back on the diet really, really strictly for about three or four years. I've been doing these therapies. And honestly, one morning I woke up next to my wife and I said, Alicia, my feet, they feel, they feel normal. And I ran my finger down the side of my foot. I was like, I can't believe it. They're not, that feeling is, is no longer there. There's no more burning, there's no, more, there's no loss of sensation. And I can honestly say, I, for the first time in my life, I, I, I found that I've recovered a symptom had recovered. It's undeniable. I feel it. And I was like, right, well, this has convinced me more than ever that I'm along the right track here. Because if, I, if I've managed to rid my soles, my feet of that feeling after nine years, then I must be doing something right. Um, I do want to come on to one other complimentary therapy as well, because I've had another one that's listed on your profile, which was that you've got experience with homeopathy. Yeah. Um, so how's that? Because I'm get, this is because I'm going for the you know, from the more that there's a bit of science behind it to less, if you like. That's homeopathy is probably a, the least scientific evidence behind it. Well, how, how I'm really that? glad you you brought this up 
because I had forgotten. And when I, I remember, if you are back to the earlier part of our discussion where I was depressed and I was trying to look for any answer, any way to cure this, what is the answer? How do I get out of this jam? My father was having a curry one night in his local town and he had just discussing it with, and he said, Oh no, he needs to see you know, this doctor. He can cure his MS. He works with lots of, uh, lots of MS patients all over the world. He's from Chennai in India. His name's Dr. Ram Krishna. Anyway, so I thought, oh, and I was like, I was like, damn, I'm like, I want to kiss you, dad. I, I, I love you. I can't believe you found, you've eventually found the answer for me. He said, oh, I tell you. And so I sat, went, sent me for a, an appointment with this doctor in London, in this hotel. And he was telling me how he would get me in complete remission within three years if I took the remedies he told me to take. And I remember asking, is there any, should I change my diet? Is there anything else I should do that, that could help there? Should I stop drinking? He said, oh, no, no, nothing. There's nothing you can, there's nothing of that would make any difference at all. I so, yeah, and I started taking these remedies, um, like three little sugary pills, one, once in the morning, once at midday, once at night. I did this for three years. But he had told me, without a shadow of a doubt, that he could cure me. At this point, when I was taking these pills, I fully believed it. And my mind went from despair right back to hope. There was an answer. I was getting myself out of this jam and everything was going to be fine. And it was in that period, something suddenly clicked. I was like, whether or not this is actually going to be the case or not. Or what I did change is my mindset from despairing, fearing the worst, mm -hmm. thinking the worst is going to happen, thinking there's no answer, there's nothing I can do, to I'm going to be fine. And I felt fantastic. And my friends and my mother were like, oh, Mike's back. What happened to Mike? Oh, all of a sudden, we've got our Mike back. All that happened is my mind, my mindset changed. And that is when Attitude, I think it's Connor Devine. I found him as well. He's a fellow from Northern Ireland who's quite big in the MS space in terms of his, his, his social media. And his yeah. yeah, he follows. Yeah, he's, he's got career, a, so. a, bug, uh, yeah. A, uh, yeah, a book out, etc. But his, his mantra is attitude is everything. And I couldn't agree more. Once I changed my attitude to positive rather than negative, there's no looking back, and I haven't since. You know, whether uh, obviously I don't know whether his uh, homeopathy, his, his medicine, would have cured me. But uh, all I do know is, if I didn't see that that man, if he didn't tell me it was possible, I wouldn't have believed it. And the fact that I believed it managed to turn my whole world around and make me positive rather than negative. And I've, I've lived that way ever since. My mind is my mindset is up, and I'm only trying to be positive. And I'm never, ever going to go back into that really despairing, depressive state. I think that there is that there's proof that <clears throat> placebo effect is real. It's not. They, they have to. So when they test out drugs, they have to give people fake drugs as well, because they know that if they give people drugs, then a proportion of them will get well just because they've been told they've been given the latest drug. So they have to give people fakes to take out the placebo effect. Placebo effect being that some people will get better because they're told they're taking a drug that makes them better. And it's quite a high proportion. It's bizarrely like they did it in the UK. There was a, there was a, a, a Dr. Michael Mosley and he did a test on it. They cured like 50% of people by giving them nothing at all. They didn't give them anything, any cure whatsoever. And they had a 50% success rate. They said, well, any normal drug, if it has 50% success rate, we'll go straight to market because that's brilliant for anything. You know, 50% of people will be cured. And he said, we didn't give them anything. We just gave them, I think we just gave them saline drips or something, injections. It was nothing. And um, But but that is another thing because you sort of think you have to believe in what you're doing. And I think that's what part of the overcoming MS that I like is that there's so many citations at the end. It's like, it's like okay, this is fully science-backed. And that really took me as like, okay, I, I do believe in it. I trust it. And I think if you're skeptical about it, then you actually it doesn't mean it wouldn't work because, you know, um, ibuprofen works for your headache because it's a, you know, it, that it does has a, has a chemical effect, but it's certainly got the full benefit. I think you have to, you have to believe in it and you have to research it and trust it and believe in it because it's, it's a real thing, isn't it? So um, you need to be looking at positive. Yeah, the power of the line is just it. profound. And I'm seeing more evidence of that every day. Uh, the people I speak to, the people, the things I do, uh, the worldwide community in our condition is is quite something. It's vast, and there's some really interesting people in it who can help in all different directions. You know, and yeah. I think 
most of them are the same. You know, they all will, will come back to look, they, their attitude, their mind frame, their mentality about the whole thing is is a massive driver. I'm glad it went that way because I was slightly concerned when we saw about that you'd uh, had experience of homeopathy, homeopathy that we might be down there yeah, <laughs> trying to encourage everyone to take um, mint tea. Absolutely. Your MS, but, no, I think uh, absolutely, that, but it is a belief thing. I think that's absolutely, absolutely true. That seems to yeah. be, it was definitely, um, yeah, as I said, placebo effect is not, that's, yeah, that's the scientific whether or not community. Whether that had any, I mean, I, I, odds on I'd say it probably didn't have any medicinal effect on me in that way or curable, curative effect. It was worth every single penny I spent seeing that man and, and taking his sugary pills because that's what changed my life. It changed my mentality. It made me believe I was going to be okay. And I've never looked back. Um, the only thing symptomatically that affects me hugely today is a bit of uh, right leg weakness. So after walking, uh, say, four or 5,000 steps, I don't know what that equates to in miles or kilometres, uh, yeah, it's it is. Yes, yeah. so, because nowadays, because that's what that's I was trying to do. Like, so, because my mate's into fitness, and he's got his own company that do transformations. And he's like, Mike, I can you know, get you fit for your wedding. And so, what? Obviously, everyone wants to be in the best shape of their life for their wedding day. So I said, oh, okay. And he said, all right, do do ten thousand steps. Eat this. Do that. I was like, right, ten thousand. Okay, so, but yeah, I had to break that up into say three or three or four walks, or sometimes two or three walks, depending on how my day was going. And that's why I noticed that after I'd get to a certain uh, a certain distance, this leg would not. It still works. It's just the signal's a bit distorted and it doesn't work as well. I'd sit down for twenty minutes and the signal comes back. Uh, it's it's quite annoying because I used to love jogging. Uh, never, I could never do very long large distances. That's just due to my fitness more than anything. But you know, just a couple of mile around the block was something I really enjoyed. And now I can go around the block, I can do around the block, um, but that's not half a mile, it's probably around, you know, 800 um, metres, <laughs> but something that I really enjoy. Um, mm -hmm. So while I'm working now, I've joined the MS gym, because I spoke to people in our community and they said they've had great benefit from it. But I must talk to, oh, I forget the guy's name now, who runs that, very clever, right? I must get on with the field because I've, I've been paying for the MS gym for a couple of months now and I've not been able to do one session. Um, mm -hmm. Due to obviously uh, fatherhood and biz busy business tonight, and it's just that I cannot find uh, the course on the MS gym that's for me because there's not a lot I can't do. I'm I'm, I'm in the gym and I, I'm I'm very strong. I can lift very heavy weights. I can squat. I need to have something that I need this leg fixing. How do I do this? <laughs> but I'm sure he'll ha outline it within his his uh, different different things. And yeah, I I certainly recommend talking to people about the MS gym because the people in the community I spoke to had had such profound effect from it. Yeah, there are a number of different ones as well. I have to say that, yeah, we, we've interviewed several of them. So the MS gym, there's uh, MS workouts, uh, very good. Um, Jeff Gotti, there's missing uh, link. Gretchen Hawley, who, yeah, Missing Link. Um, and I think I'm probably missing one. Oh, um, Dom Thorpe is a UK-based guy. Dom Thorpe, Thorpe Fitness is a, another MS one from the UK. Uh, there, I, I mean, I would recommend. So I try them out when they're on a podcast episode. I was, yeah, actually, sort of give it a go because they normally have a trial subscription for most of them. Um, and I think, yeah, I I try them because I think they're different for different people. Um, but I think some people in the UK don't really like MS Jim because he's He's, I'm not being offensive, but very American. <laughs> oh, it's, it's, it's got, it's very, kind of what we'd see in the UK is a very, like, very, very outward, very, like, um, quite loud and encouraging. And if you want anything, something a bit more understated, then he might not be for you. But equally, you might find that really encouraging. So y you can try out. They're basically different personalities yeah. is the main thing, I think. And they have slightly different ways of doing things, slightly different ways of recording things. Um, so yeah, try 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 a few out because they'll almost always give you some sort of cheat or free trial um, for their system. Um, but yeah, good good to be doing a system definitely. I think it gives a lot of accountability as well. Um, but ju just change uh, topic. You're so you mentioned you're a new father. So congratulations for that. Um, 
the seventh pillar of overcoming MS is to prevent MS in your family members. So um, what are you and your wife doing for that seventh pillar? No, uh, thank you for father? asking. Yeah, it's certainly uh, my mother, my sister, her, my brother, and my in-laws um, are very much, you know, because um, it's, I'm obviously very concerned because I had a daughter and obviously MS is a lot more prevalent in women than it is men. And mm-hmm. I suppose like anyone with the condition we have, if you have, um, you have children, the very last thing you'd want is to pass that on in any way, in you know, whatever you could do to prevent the chances happening, uh, you will try hopefully try and embed. So, um, for the first few weeks and months, I didn't allow her any, any dairy formula. <laughs> I was having soy formula and things like this. And then when I looked into it more on the MS, uh, OMS, it actually didn't say that you shouldn't use dairy formula in, uh, as, as, as a preventative because apparently dairy formula, dairy in itself would only become a, a huge issue if you have MS, not to contract it. I don't know if that's true or not. I just, I didn't, on the Overcoming MS website, I didn't see dairy for your children being, uh, need, needs to be avoided. But I would certainly revise that if it does prove the case. And I'll certainly be encouraging my daughter as she gets out of her tender years to come with daddy on his non-dairy adventure because I don't think it actually brings you, I, don't, I just don't think you need it. You know, um, I said to my wife, if you were, if you were, you know, mm-hmm really thirsty would you go into a field and suck a cow's udder you just it could be nothing more unrealistic that you'd ever do it's just we are i know you i've heard you say this yourself jeff on other podcasts you know it, it's meant for baby calves we're the only animal in the world that drink the milk of another animal and it is all just marketing and obviously a need that they could push out there um so yeah dairy for me there's no need for it and I, I would certainly be advocating um, that you stop your whole family drinking it. And you'll be amazed, actually, if you do come off it for a month or so and then you drink it again, just how the taste isn't isn't quite what you thought it was. Uh, my, my wife now, she doesn't drink dairy. She now drinks oat milk and uh, coconut milk and other things. Yeah. I think that's the thing, actually. You need to find the yeah. right non-dairy milk. We're not supposed to call them milk, are you? I think the milk industry get, get in trouble for that. <laughs> milk like drinks over there but um, i mean i'm a big fan of oat milk and coffee i think oat yeah, milk coffee is really nice but doesn't I, the tea i've not really perfected which being english should, yeah. should do but it doesn't quite work well in tea but then there's other things so so you do end up having it sort of slightly different sometimes mm-hmm. you have an almond milk sometimes yeah i don't want to be a salesman for any circular brand but i think one of the brands i won't mention brands but one of the brands does thing called my cuppa and it's specific oat milk that is designed for tea because it, it yeah and, you, and I, I've tried it, and it does taste like a cup of tea. My family are all Mancunians, and they were, they're mad for tea. <laughs> like they must, I mean, they were, if they drank nothing else, but last last drink they could have, they'd have a cup of tea. And my, my mother will not have oat milk in her yeah. tea. But I, I tried my cup, and she was like, yeah, that actually tastes like tea. <laughs> so yeah, it was designed to... Yeah, my cup, I'll give that, give that a look up, because it, honestly, it's the saviour if you're a tea drinker. Well, we are a bit of a nation of tea, tea, tea drinkers, so yeah, I have to give it a go. Sorry, <laughs> Americans listening to this, I know that's yeah. a bit of tea. <laughs> that's why they just said, because I, well, I used to go to America a lot with work, and uh, they always said, if you go into a coffee shop there, because it's quite intimidating, because people will have these ridiculously complex orders, and you just go in there and say, have a latte, <laughs> and everyone else has defined everything about this, this, this drink. And they said, just go and ask them for a cup of tea, it would completely scare them, because <laughs> you're English. They get, they get. Oh my God! An English person asks for a cup of tea. I'll do it wrong. I'll, uh, oh, it, it worries yeah. them, and they don't really know how to do tea. But um, yeah, so yeah, sorry, it's quite incredible. Things, but, um, yes, we are somewhat tea obsessed. Um, so um, yeah, so the seventh. So you. So essentially, though, but you're saying is it is important to try to um, at least have the healthier aspects of the OMS program for children. Is an important Absolutely, and sorry for not touching on others. I certainly will, we, we've been sure that she gets adequate vitamin D. I know that's an important thing for babies anyway, it's encouraged, but particularly in, in our case, she gets a lot of vitamin D. Um, she'll certainly be, I know she's only a baby yet, so when she does um, grow a bit older, we'll obviously be teaching her all about the, the wonderful uh, exercise things that she can do for herself. Uh, I'll be making her fruit smoothies and all sorts of smoothies with all daddy's wonderful potions in <laughs> that, that he finds helps. Um, 
yeah, just uh, there's so many different aspects that are beneficial for just for, as you say, for general health, regardless of the nurse. So as many of them that I can get her to encourage her to, to follow us on, I'm only doing her a service because it's only going to improve her health. And I'll only help her yeah. you know, with all the work, luck and the will in the world uh, avoid the same fate as I have had. Um, another thing, we've, met, we've mentioned a few of the people who've been on the podcast as, as guests, and one of them yeah. is uh, Matthew Embry, um, who's a um, filmmaker and also has uh, the MS Hope program. And he has, it's not exactly the same as Overcoming MS, but we had a chat with him on the program, on the podcast, and he's very similar um, to to Overcoming MS, what he, what he proposes. Um, and he's done a world tour recently, um, and I believe that you met him and have chosen to uh, remove gluten from your diet. So, so what influences has Matt Embury had or Matthew Embury had? Well, oh, yeah, he's also been huge. Uh, thanks for bringing him up. Because um, Matt would be, I don't know how old Matt is now, but he must be in his 40s, mid 40s, maybe. Um, and he's, a, yeah, he's a very he's 40s, athletic, yeah. uh, uh, successful man. And uh, when I was, when I saw him, uh, he may have been, let's give him a, oh, so I was, I was 24, he would have been 35, 34. And I'm thinking, wow, look at this guy. You know, he's had a mess for, at the time, probably 15, 16, 17 years. Oh, and he's, he's the picture of health. He's got, he's got no symptoms. This is the life he leads and he swears by it. And he's trying to push it on all the medical industry to say, look, you know, get vitamin, get involved with vitamin D, get, get, get your diet sorted out. And no one's listening to him because there's no money in it. And I thought, right, this this is kind of this is really inspiring to me. And, and obviously, he's very, very. He's got a big social media presence now, and he, he's always talking to the community. And when I heard he was coming around the country, I was like, well, if I can meet him, I'm definitely going to meet him. And someone else online, uh, I, I reached out to someone else online that I'd met through the MS world, and he says, yeah, I've been talking to his father, Doctor Ashton, and we can get him to come to this particular place on this particular date because he's going to be filming. Uh, he's, he's, he's got um, he's got a uh, a film out actually. You'll know, you'll be aware of it, Living Proof. Yeah, Living Proof. That's right. Yeah. So I, Amazon. I, yeah. He's got another. He's got, that's got another film coming out. Um, that's what I'm going to touch on. So uh, Living Proof. Anyone who hasn't seen that, I couldn't recommend it highly enough. Um, you know, it's it's it, it just opens your eyes to a lot more things, and you know, nothing. You don't have to believe everything. Um, but it's just his his world and what he's looked into, and he's really researched different aspects and different ways around different cures, different therapies. And it's a super interesting, super interesting uh, uh, film. And yeah, apparently, so he's filming Living Fruit too. And during when I went to visit him, he was filming a bit of it there. So there's every chance I might be on it for like mm, that long. But uh, yeah, so they were filming. Uh, he was showing mm -hmm. a live screening of Living Proof to those who haven't seen it and those that want to catch up on it. And he was doing a bit of a Q&A and I just had to say to him, look, you know, Matt, uh, thank you for all that you've done. Thank you for going public, you know, because you've inspired so many. And when I, there's a picture of him on some magazine in the States or in Canada. I said, when I saw that photo of you, like a, like an athlete, like a football star on this, on this, on this, um, on this magazine, I thought, I want to be like that guy. And he said, oh, thank you, man. Thank you for saying that. And uh, yeah, he so he, that might, that flip I'm hoping will be in the for it too, but I don't know. He is, oh, he's man. probably lean buff, isn't he? He's, um, he's a know, very well well guy. Yeah. I've never looked like that have, in my life. Well, so to have MS, MS. MS, the period he has, and to be running marathons and you know, coming second or third or first, actually, in some sense, in his age group, is the most phenomenal thing I've ever known. You know, this is a, mm. supposed to be a debilitating disease, or he's living proof, as he calls it, that it doesn't have to be. And I'm so inspired by it that... I'm, I'm, I'm full sure that with all the different things that we've discussed here, that my leg can come back. I can find a new pathway and I'll be able to run again. Uh, well, run further. I still can run, but run a little bit further than just round the block for 800 metres. And it's something that I reach for. Uh, but yeah, uh, having examples like that, it's helped me so, so much, you know, mentality wise. And just to get right, it is possible. George Janonek, Matthew Embry, um, Oh, there are there are some others that as you'll know you'll know them all. Conrad Divine. Um, there's many many different uh, examples of people in our in our world that have defied the odds and gone against convention, 
and that, that, I'm sure if you contact any of them, they'll be ever so happy to to lend their ear. And I want to also, I don't know what use I'd be, but anyone that was feeling a particular way or feeling really down about it, I'd be more than happy to talk to any of you because it's something that I wish, I know it sounds a bit conceited, but I wish there was me around when I was diagnosed to talk to. If I could speak to, I'm going to be 35 on the 16th of June, if I could speak to 35-year-old Mike when I was 24 and I was just diagnosed, he could tell me, ah, look, all this is going on, but I can tell you how it's been for me and it's not everything you might be imagining and just to hear and see that I was walking towards him or I, I was actually not, not in pain, you know, I think that could be, that would have been a massive help to me, but there wasn't anybody because it was so, the world wasn't so uh, and, and coming uh, and becoming with coming out and talking about it. But now I think the world has changed and, and people are more um, ready to share their experiences. And in fact, there was one girl called, I mean, I won't mention her name, but she got in touch with me on, on, on Twitter uh, to say, you know, thank you so much for what I'd shared. I can't remember if it was a post or a picture of her saying oh, this, this and this and trying to you know, encourage. And that it really turned her day around and she she felt so much better about it and it gave her great hope and anything like that. I, I, you know, it just It's great to hear and I'm, I'm happy to, to to lend my ear or any words of advice to anyone that wanted it. You can contact me. I'm sure Jeff will give you the details on the podcast. Yeah, we'll put, we can put your details in the show notes. And yeah, yeah, and I think the the whole so the whole idea of overcoming MS circles, like having like groups of people, um, and and that just is something it didn't exist when I started on this, um, which you, I would about now twenty sixteen, so it's like yeah, six seven years ago, um, and yeah, it didn't really exist. There was no yeah where I lived, there was no one else at all and now there's a whole community of us and i think it's, it has the one of one good thing about the internet is really sort of spread communication in good ways so it allows people to get in contact more and the, and, and overcoming ms and building on this circles idea and then this new app coming out and then and trying to make it easier for everyone to communicate um so just to, to wrap up though looking back over the last 10 years you mentioned if there was um a mike kennedy who was 35 when you were 25 what would you say to your recently diagnosed self um, or to those other people that you might meet who are recently diagnosed? What would I say? Uh, well, hopefully I could see myself in person. So I could grab my 24-year-old self and I, you could see that I was very strong and walking and okay. Because I think just that that alone, you know, seeing is believing. So when if I were to see someone who was actually physically fine, or, or at least gave the appearance of being physically fine, that would just that would really calm you down because you you'd be panicking. I was panicking about you know, the very worst scenarios. That I was going to go downhill very quickly, and this was going to be a very unpleasant ride. And I was even looking at pictures of my siblings in my <laughs> thinking, oh, I can't be the be- I won't be the best man at my brother's wedding. You know, I, I won't be able to stand up. That kind of thing. You know, you, you despair. So yeah, just to mm-hmm. to gra- to speak to that person and give them the example and to, to reassure them that look, you know tough break but believe me it's not all bad news and there's so much we can there's so much you can do to make this situation much better for yourself in fact there's so, in so many ways i'm a lot healthier now than i would have been had i not had ms i know that sounds pretty strange but it's, it's true uh, i eat a lot healthier my weight's a lot healthier uh, i'm not saying i wouldn't wish i didn't have it but it's certainly given me a lot of positives as well as negatives without a doubt and I, I think that, that there's now less chance that I'm going to die of cancer, heart disease, diabetes. And actually, they're the things that kill you. Most people are going to die of cancer or heart disease. You know, so that actually, we've reduced the risk of dying. Thank of you for mentioning that. Really common Recently, things. I went to the Nuffield Health and had a health checkup. The first one I'd done, they, they took you know, did all the measurements, all the biometrics, or pinprick of the blood. And, and they literally did that. They came back and said, okay, you know, other than the, the diagnosis you've disclosed to us, yeah. uh, Did they, you yeah. are you are yeah. such you, you are such low it's, risk for all the other major diseases. Uh, the, the, your metrics are so low. You are you just keep doing what you're doing, and you know. And I won't, I won't yeah. lie. I mean, I, I've I've lacked stuff a little bit since my wedding, so I wasn't quite the show within. So you could do with losing you know a few pounds, five or six pounds. But uh, other than that, I was in tip top condition, and I can only say it's because. I get told this that I guess that you're like they just like, yeah, they go 
yeah, you're in, oh, you're amazing health. Like all your all your bloods and everything, everything like your your blood pressure, everything we've tested. You're in amazing health. I'm like, yeah, but I am in here because I've got MS. I'm in like an MS connection. Yeah, well, apart from yeah, that, that, the, discounting the the reason you're here. Yeah, yeah besides uh, yes, the autoimmune elephant health. in the room, you're you're the picture of health. <laughs> yeah, but. But but I mean, it doesn't MS doesn't kill you? It's um, so if we can keep it under control, and the things that would kill us, we're actually preventing them as well. Then that's obviously yeah, absolutely, and that's the big positive. The one of the biggest positives I can take is that it's re really made you look at my health uh, as a view. You know that I would not have looked at my health with such a microscope. Who who would in their twenties? You know, it's just not something you just think you're going to live forever, and you think you're bulletproof. And I, I very I quickly learned in the mid twenties that I'm certainly not. <laughs> and that the things that the blocks I'm building now, I'm sure are going to bear fruit when I get into my later years. And I can't thank becoming MS for everything right. that they're doing because it's certainly given me a great example and something to follow. And this podcast, can I just say, I've listened to most of them, and I, it's a great comfort to me. All the different people I hear coming on, sharing their stories, sharing their trials and tribulations and the things that they do. And uh, yeah, thank you to everyone who's come on this podcast because it's a huge, uh, it's a huge resource for me, and I do find it a great comfort and a great, a great place to learn new things. Um, well, with that, I'd like to thank you as well for um, sharing your very inspiring story, and um, thank you very much for joining us on the. the You're welcome. And I hope we can catch up again very soon. For listening to this episode of Living Well with MS. Please check out this episode's show notes at overcomingms.org slash podcast. You'll find useful links and bonus information there. Have questions or ideas to share? Email us at podcast at overcomingms.org or you can reach out to Jeff on Twitter at Jeff Alex. We'd love to hear from you. Thanks again for tuning in and see you next time for tips on living a full and happy life with MS.